this technique, you could use an object with lots of pieces in it, but to keep things simple, we're just gonna use some two-point poly chains. So to create these two-point polys, I'm gonna create a box pointing up on the Y, F2 to center that. Now under the Setup tab, Fiber Effects. So here we are, let's hit the Grow button. Doesn't matter about the length particularly, but I'm gonna go for one meter here. Edge quality, we should basically subdivide it. Let's put in 99 there. Fiber size one, that's basically two point poly chain. And for fiber quantity, I don't need 100, something about 20 should do us. Well, let's put in 30. So let's okay that. And then in the second layer, we'll have created those two point poly chains. The only other thing to do is press W on the keyboard. And under polygon statistics, we don't want the one vertex created, so we'll get the plus there and delete them. Let's cut that and put them into layer one. And let's rotate them around 90 degrees, press F3, Z minus, okay to that. So now they're trailing behind the origin, if you like, they're gonna go in that direction. A little bit too spread apart, so H to bring that in and squash it up a little bit. That's good, and that's effectively it for our modeling. Here we are in layout. The first thing I'd like to do is offset each of these two point polys. So with that selected, P for properties, I'm gonna remove these so it's clear what's going on, and then add a nodal displacement. I could quite easily use DP kit here, but just for change, let's go native. So let's look for a mesh part, I think it's called. So that gives me the part index. And then I also need a translate. The basic rule of thumb I found is that if you're using any of the native deformers under the displacement, set the mode to set. And then nothing should shift around in a funny sort of way. Uh, the only thing I need now is a random, and I want a random vector. So my part index will go into the seed and my output will go into the translation. Whee, it's gone all over the place. Let's see our settings. Let's zero these out. So that's effectively nothing. And for the maximum range, we'll just put in minus one, see what that gives us. Probably a little bit too much. Who knows really at this point, but that's a good starting point. So let's close that down. Um, and let's call this offset. So again, we're gonna make lives a little easier on ourselves by stacking up the modifiers. Now's a good time to set up our spline. You could use DP kit spline, which is an excellent choice. You could also then use the native spline control, but that would mean setting up Possibly hundreds of bones, which really gets on my nerves. So I'm gonna use instead the D, B and W spline toolkit, which is available via Patreon. So definitely check them out because it's great. I find this easy to control in a flat plane. We'll start in top view, add an edit spline. So I think we have to click once and then we have to click again. So let's just drag out the handles. Let's add some peaks and troughs as well. I love these controller handles. The only thing to check is that our normals are all nice and orderly, which they are here. That's a good start. I'm also gonna find a quick camera angle for us. So something like that is pretty good. This is in perspective view. So now I'm gonna select the camera and I'm gonna go up here and select match viewpoint perspective, selected camera for press six. Cool, so that is the path we'll be taking. We are now gonna attach our two point poly chains to this spline. So let's select that. P for properties, let's turn the offset off for now and go to add modifier and let's add another nodal displacement and we'll call that spline. So we'll go to the DBNW spline stuff and what we want here is the deformation. We'll click on that and we want the spline that we've just created. Let's just see if that works. So the displacement into the input. So it looks like we're on the wrong axis. We may have to give the timeline a nudge to update. There it is right at the beginning. For both pre and post behavior, we're gonna select, uh, what are we gonna select? Extend, I think. I'm gonna turn on Studio Live here, so it's a live update. In absolute mode, as you can see, the distance is in meters, so we can move that up there. That's all good. But in this example, we are gonna go for relative, which means everything is in percentages. So we start at 0% and at 100% we'll be at the end of the spline. But we could also go past 100% because we're set to extend down here. 
We'll now sprinkle these two point poly chains along the spline. So let's close that down. And similar to before, we're gonna go for a mesh part. So we've got that part index and then we're gonna go for a random. We just need a scalar here. So the part index into the seed and we're gonna go from zero to one. Could include those. And I'm gonna take the output into the offset percentage. So there they all are, all nicely sprinkled along the path. There's a good first step, but obviously we want to add a bit of movement to this. Firstly, I'm going to show how we can do a loop. Now I have Mike Wolf, courtesy of DBNW, to thank for this, because there's no way I would have uh, worked this out myself. We'll start with a time node and an add node. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to add the time to the random node here, and that gives us what we'd expect there. Everything just shooting off into the distance. Let's say we want to do a loop every four seconds. Now this is where Mike's technique comes into play. We'll grab a scalar, and this is where we're going to add our four seconds. So let's put in four there. And I'm going to need a multiply and a mod. So quite simply, we're going to multiply the random scalar here with our four second scalar here. And we're going to add that to the time. And then we're going to mod that output with the same four seconds and that will be fed into the offset percentage now i'm at 25 frames a second so four times 25 so frame 100 should be exactly the same as frame zero which it is so if i put in 99 here we should have a seamless loop So just to tidy this up for you, because it's very simple, but very effective. That's our loop of four seconds. Random is from zero to 100% or zero to one, randomly spread across the spline. It's all modded by the same four seconds and we get a nice loop as a result. So if you needed a shorter loop, obviously you would just decrease this value here and it loops every two seconds now or even one second. Now, if you decided that this was moving too fast, what we could do instead is put a multiply node in there. Let's half the speed, so 0 0.5, so now running at half the speed. So although it says one here, it'll actually be one times 0 0.5, which is two, which is this. So frame 50 should now look the same as frame zero, which it does. Now we know how to loop, I'm going to throw that all out the window now because I want each of these little pieces to run at varying speeds, which means finding a loop point will be next to impossible. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to extend my loop rate to about four seconds as it was before. All I'm going to do is take this random scalar, copy and paste it. Again, I'm going to use the part index and I'm going to feed that output into the time multiplier here. So as you can see, some pieces are running slowly, some pieces are running very fast, and that can be controlled with these settings here. So zero would be no movement at all. So let's put point, I don't know, point 0.5 in there. Let's put point 0.7 in here. Okay, so now I've got some settings that I'm sort of reasonably happy with. We have a variety of slow and fast moving pieces here. So now this value is really my limiter. So although it's shooting off down there, I don't necessarily need it to be such a high value. So I could take this value down and just make sure that the last point has passed the end of the spline, so to speak. Let's just fatten the widths up. Now you could just do this in model and scale it out, but another quick way to do it would be just to chuck a bone in there. So let's add a bone. Remember to add the modifier, R to rest, and let's just fatten it up slightly. Make sure it's at the top of the stack. Actually, I'm not sure that offset was needed at all, was it really? Anyway, uh, <laughs> so just be careful where you have corners like this. If they're too sharp, the objects may start deforming in strange sort of ways. But that's a quick, quick cheat. Although I don't like using bones for this sort of stuff, that's a quick cheat and it works quite nicely. And then turn them off. Let's get on to some texturing. So I'm gonna turn off VPR. Uh, and as a note, let's turn off Studio Live as well. And as a note, uh, I've turned off GI. So two point poly chain and we will go to the edges tab and we will put in a minus number here. And that's a little bit too fat for what I'm after. 
So let's take it down. So let's say, let's say that's the maximum width I wanted to go to. So let's edit nodes and let's go for a mesh part and a random. Okay, now the uh, part indexed into the seed. Um, now this one, this would be 100% of this value here. So that should give me a variety of different sizes. We could try adding a texture to this to vary even more. Let's just try a turbulence. There we go, so I've just added a turbulence on top just for, for a slightly more organic look. <laughs> it's quite funny, isn't it? However, I'm just gonna stick with the random sizes like this for now. I'm also thinking that I want these as neon tubes. I'm gonna delete this light and then I'm gonna turn off the environment light. So everything is gonna go very dark. I'm gonna go over to items, add lights, and I'm gonna go for a primitive light. So for the primitive, I need to point to the two point polychain, and then I want to click on sample surfaces so we will all go dark. Let's get the surface editor up. And what I'm gonna do is under luminous, I'm gonna make that 100%. So the primitive lights are taking the value from this value here. Okay, so let's go into nodes. Similar to before, let's get a mesh part and a gradient. Now I think I've got about 30 parts within this object. I'm unlikely to remember that each time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remap these to a zero to one range. So again, I'm gonna go for a random, take the part index, uh, include minimum and maximum, and I'll feed that into the input. So however many parts there are in this object are now remapped to a scale of zero to one, which means I can just put a keyframe at this end. Let's make it, I don't know, let's give it a neon magenta. Let's put that one to stepped. Let's just make this a bluey, bright, bright blue. Okay, that, and then let's plug that into the luminous color. Okay, that's kind of working, but it's not quite what we want. So let's randomize the random. It's gonna multiply. Let's take the part index into the multiply and then multiply into the seed. And then let's give it something higher than zero. Okay, and then let's just play around with that until we see something we like. And obviously we can add an extra color to this. So let's add a floor, I'll add a null and call it plane. Uh, no, I won't, I'll call it floor. P of properties and I'll turn that into a shape plane. I'll move it around, move it into place. Let's just move it under the spline for now. And while I'm here, I'm gonna take down the size of that tube. The reason I'm using the primitive light in this instance is it gives me some additional options. Uh, so I could turn it to visible to camera and turn off the tube. So that's all the light just coming from the primitive light now. Go to the floor, let's take the color down so it doesn't spread so far. Or I could just use the surface of the polish just for a slightly different look. So it's entirely up to you to experiment and how you want to light your scene. Hope you found this useful. I'd love to continue making these, but uh, who knows what the future holds for Lightwave. I could find myself with some spare time. 